The following is a presentation of VBR. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in our study of God's Holy Word. Hello, and welcome back to our study of the book of James. In our last session, we were looking at James chapter 2. And in that chapter, James deals with the topic of impartiality and prejudice in the first part of chapter 2. And then in the latter part of chapter 2, he deals with how important it is to have works with our faith, because faith without works is dead. We're now ready to move to James chapter 3, which is a very famous chapter. And it deals, at least in the first part, with the subject of the tongue and speech. James chapter 3 is noted for its exhortation about the tongue. But interestingly, James introduces this subject with a verse on teaching. In James chapter 3, verse 1, he says, My brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we all shall receive a stricter judgment. Now, when James says many of you, it does seem to imply or show the tendency of a large section of the early church to want to speak during their assemblies and group meetings. Paul had to deal with this to keep order in the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. But the worship service of the early church was dynamic and a little bit unstructured compared to maybe what we're used to today. But yet, Paul did exhort the Corinthians to make sure they did things decently and in order, because God is not the author of confusion. When James says, be not many teachers, James is not discouraging us from the work of teaching. He does not want to discourage any who might have been qualified for the work of teaching. His words were meant rather to remind us of our responsibilities rather than to deter us from our duties. The need for such a caution may have grown out of several circumstances that the church was enduring at that time. Number one, the Christian meetings were open, unstructured, and probably relatively informal, and anyone wishing to be heard could rise and speak. That has a wonderful spontaneity, but it can lead to confusion and not things done in an orderly fashion. Secondly, a great honor was attached to the work of teaching. As Paul commented on in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, where teachers were ranked second only to apostles and prophets. And naturally led self-seekers may have been tempted to teach for the honor, even if they were unqualified or unlearned on the subject they were trying to teach. Number three, some of James' readers, perhaps many of them, had come out of Judaism. And the characteristic of many of those who were described by Paul in Romans chapter 2, to the effect that their total lack of true qualifications did not detour their conceited and arrogant assumption of the office of teacher, that they would take. And fourthly, the Judaizers who attempted to craft the forms and ceremonies of the Mosaical law upon the church were particularly were a particularly troublesome element of the church, which sorely needed caution, as expressed here by James. Someone, maybe with tongue in cheek or maybe with quite seriousness, said, Teaching is the inoculation of of the incomprehensible into the minds of the ignorant by the means of the incompetent. Another one said, teaching is the transfer of material from the teacher's notebook to the student's notebook without going through the mind of either. Now, both of those statements are not completely true and certainly are not to be true in the church and are probably spoken with a bit of sarcasm or tongue in cheek. Sadly, however, it can be true and it shouldn't be that way, especially in the church. Webster defines teaching as to show how or to help to learn, to guide the study of, to provide with knowledge and insight. Learning, however, is largely a 
individual activity. That's why our personal study is so valuable. Yes, it's good to meet with the brethren and study and share our thoughts and exchange our thoughts on what passages mean and how they apply to our lives. But the real depth of our understanding of Scripture usually comes from our private, individual studies. With us, our Bibles open and our hearts open to the Lord. But there are times when we need to help each other in understanding the Scriptures. That's why the eunuch said to Philip in Acts chapter 8, verse 31, How can I understand except some man guide me? Learning to learn is really more precious than knowledge itself because once we learn how to learn, it's a never-ending fountain. We can all teach in some manner and have therefore the duty to do so. We would not accept or think it's appropriate for a Christian to say, I do not have the gift of praying, so I will not pray. I do not have the gift of giving, so I will not give. I do not have the gift of evangelizing, therefore I will not witness. So why would we accept the premise, I do not have the gift of teaching, therefore I will not teach? No, we all have the ability to teach. Some from the pulpits, some one-on-one, some over the backyard fence. But teaching is a tremendous responsibility, a tremendous privilege, and a tremendous duty for all of God's children. In the first century, teachers were very important. Whenever mentioned, godly teachers were always honored by the writers. In Acts chapter 13, verse 1, they were ranked with prophets who sent out Paul and Barnabas. In Paul's list of leaders, they were listed with apostles and prophets. For instance, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, It says, and God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. To the Ephesian brethren, Paul wrote in Ephesians 4 and 11, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Writing to the Romans, Paul in chapter 12, verse 6 and 7 of Romans, talks about it as being a special gift. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them in prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching. Prophets delivered God's divine will to man. Teachers explain that divine will or teaching of God to us. You might say prophets delivered the meal, teachers served it up. Now the term teachers here used in James chapter 3 verse 1 is from the Greek word didakalos. And it means to be a master or a teacher. It was often ascribed to Jesus and translated as master, but is also used and translated as teacher. In the New Testament, it was one who teaches concerning the things of God and the duties of man. It is not only a privilege for us to receive the word of God and faith in the Lord, it is our duty then to transmit it. And faith to be transmitted to faithful men who will turn, who will in turn teach it to others. The church depends on an unbroken chain of teachers. Yet there were men who failed in this duty. They failed by sometimes being false teachers. And the scriptures repeatedly warned the early church and us about having to deal with false teachers. Secondly, there were some that undoubtedly tried to teach before they learned. You can't teach what you don't know. Paul writing to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1 verses 6 and 7 says, From which some, having strayed, have turned aside to idle talk, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm. Trying to teach when you don't understand. 
And thirdly, there was undoubtedly some that pandered to the desires of their audience. And Paul warns Timothy about that in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, where he says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Having itching ears, wanting to hear what they want to hear rather than sometimes what the Word of God has for them. But apart from that, James seems to be saying that teaching is a serious duty of the Christian. Because he says, as teachers, we will incur a stricter judgment. Knowledge and leadership bring greater responsibilities. In Luke chapter 12, verse 48, we are told, To whom much is given, much will be required. Now remember, we can all and all are teachers. We may teach in different ways, more publicly for some, more privately for others. But this is not a duty or a command that man or woman can ignore in their walk with Christ. And while teaching is essential... James is going to also tell us how it can be dangerous and must be entered into carefully. While godly teachers are to be valued, respected, and honored, those very things can turn the head of a man. As William Barclay said so well, every teacher runs the risk of becoming Sir Oracle. I like that explanation. Sir Oracle with the puffing up of the chest as if here I am and my eloquent speech and you're blessed to hear it. No, that's not the Christian way. A Christian teacher is to be humble. Consider it a privilege to express the word of God to people, not something on which egos are built. No activity, however, is more liable to fostering of intellectual pride. Every godly teacher must, number one, teach God's truth and not his own version of it or opinions and prejudices. And two, exercise great care that he does not contradict his teaching with his life. People will always hear what we do so much more loudly than what we say. James is not saying that we should not strive to be godly teachers, but that as we teach, we are subject to a greater condemnation, a stricter judgment, if we fail to do it in a godly manner. This warning, however, cannot be an excuse for not using our abilities to teach. The parable of the talents clearly says that God is not happy when we do not use the talents he has given us. But rather, James is simply giving us a warning of its grave responsibilities. And this warning, this first verse, is an interesting introduction into the next section in James chapter 3 about the tongue. The same instrument, the tongue, that can do so much good in encouraging and in spreading the word can also do much damage. I'd now like to read for you James chapter 3 verses 2 through 12 and I'll be reading from the New King James translation. For we all stumble in many things, but if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and they turn their whole body. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder, wherever the pilot desires." Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile, And creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. 
With it, we bless our God and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring yields both salt water and fresh. James's overriding thought is how important and how hard it is to control ourselves in the area of our speech. The tongue or our speech can be the best and the worst of each of us. Decency in our culture today has at best become relativistic and at worst it has disappeared. The censor, once a position to protect us from filth, is quickly fading away into meaninglessness. Yet the Lord long ago set up established boundaries for our speech. In the Ten Commandments, back in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, he says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And yet hardly a day goes by when we don't hear somebody taking the Lord's name in vain. Jesus, in Matthew chapter 12, verse 37, says, For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. Paul carries this same thought that we saw in the Old Testament, in the mission of Jesus, when he writes to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not even be named among you, as it is fitting for saints, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. You know, there are several ways in which people decide or form an opinion of what kind of a person we are. Some of these are valid and some of them are invalid, but they are used anyway. Number one, people judge us by how we dress. Are we clean? Are we dirty? Do we dress modestly or do we dress to attract attention to ourselves? Secondly, I believe they judge us based on personal hygiene, our hair, our odor, our cleanliness, our grooming. Thirdly, they judge us on our behavior. Are we polite or are we rude? Are we courteous? Are we gracious? And fourthly, I would say they judge us by how we speak. Sometimes they judge us by our grammar and our sentence structure. That may not be the most valid and certainly is not the most valid way to assess a person. But they also judge us on our language, its content, whether it is foul, whether it is coarse. That says so much about us. Scripture clearly tells us that how we speak really is revealing what is in our hearts. Ungodly thoughts take the shape of the words that we utter. You know, physically the tongue is, a, is an interesting muscle. In fact, it's not a muscle, it's multiple muscles. Our tongue has eight muscles. Four of them are used to move it within our mouths and four of them are used to shape it. Our tongue contains between five and 10,000 taste buds that are replaced frequently every few weeks. There are five official senses of taste. There is sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and savory. Savory simply meaning pleasant. Interestingly enough, spicy is not a taste. Spicy is a pain. And those of us that have gotten a hold of a dish that was a little more flavored than we would like understand the pain that comes from overly spicy food. You can't really swallow your tongue, even though we use that phrase, but it can curl back and block the passage of our throat. Doctors and dentists can tell much about the rest of our health 
simply by looking at our tongues and our mouths. And that is so true spiritually also. The tongue is not evil and is and can be used for much good. Language is being is part of being created in the image of God. Being social creatures, speech is vital. It's how we interact and communicate largely one with another. And teaching, as James pointed out to us in verse 1 of chapter 3, is a very good, it can be a very positive use of our tongue. Solomon says in Proverbs 10, 31 to 32, The mouth of the righteous brings forth wisdom, but the perverse tongue will will be cut out. And the lips of the righteous know what is acceptable, but the mouth of the wicked what is perverse. A little later in Proverbs 17 and 10, he writes, Rebuke is more effective for a wise man than a hundred blows of of a fool. So the tongue can bring forth wisdom. It can bring forth correction. We know that it can bring forth encouragement. It can be used to spread the word of God. And maybe most importantly, we use it to talk to the Lord as we pray and meditate on his word. But James is also going to warn us that it can also be a deadly poison. Areas of gossip, complaining, discouragement, language that dishonors God and our fellow man. This overall guidance, James already introduced to us in the first chapter, in James chapter 1, verse 19, when he said, So then, my brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Swift to hear God's word directly from the Bible and from godly teachers. We're to go first to what God has to say about the matter. And then be slow to speak. You know, it's hard to learn while we're talking. Don't pour out our thoughts too quickly without considering them. Job, in Job chapter 40, verses 3 and 4, said, as he answered God, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Job said, I need to cover my mouth. That's a good admonition for every one of us on occasion. Run first to God. Find out what he has to say and then talk about what he thinks and not what we or men think. James tells us here that the tongue can influence many. Verses 1 and 2. He indicates in verse 2 that it is a sign of maturity when he says that if we're able to control it, we are a perfect man. Verse 2 reads, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Now perfect there is from the Greek word teleos, and it doesn't mean to be sinless, but it does mean to be complete. It carries the idea of mental and moral maturity, completeness. A full age. Someone who has a maturity and a decor that is a complete godly man or woman. And James says that if we are able to bridle our tongue, we're able to bridle the whole body well. Control of the tongue is a sign of Christ-like maturity and self-control. The thought is that if one attains mastery over the tongue, which is the most unruly and rebellious member of the body, he would also be able to control all other aspects of his life as well. Apparently, James uses the term bridle here in verse 2 as a lead-in to the horse and the bit metaphor that is contained in the next verse. But before we get to that, I'd like to go back and note that in every chapter in the book of James, all five chapters, James addresses the tongue. Let me read to you just a few of those verses. In James chapter 1, verse 19, 
So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. In verse 26 of that first chapter, If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart, and this man's religion is useless. In chapter 2, we see in verse 12, James there says, So speak, and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. We've obviously seen it here in James chapter 3. When I go to James chapter 4, verse 11, he tells us, Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. And then in chapter 5, verse 12, he also continues to remind us, But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall into judgment. James takes this concept of controlling our tongue very seriously, and he addresses it to us not only here in chapter 3, but he addresses it really to us all throughout his book. And his book is a book of practical Christian living. Many in Scripture have struggled with this. Maybe all have struggled with it. In Psalms 106, 33, it says, Moses spoke rashly with his lips. We already commented on Job saying he needed to put his hand over his mouth. When God called Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 to be a prophet, Isaiah talks about how unclean his lips were and the hot coal comes and sears his lips a symbolic manifestation of cleaning up his speech and his tongue. And all in the New Testament, we see Peter who often, especially before the day of Pentecost, would often speak maybe before he thought. Some have said that in his earlier years, Peter only opened his mouth to change feet. That's probably a little bit unkind, but Peter, to his credit, became one of the great pillars of the church as it was established in the book of Acts. And I think that's due to the Spirit working in Peter as it can work in us to help us control our tongues. Well, that concludes the time we have for this session. We will come back in our next session and begin in chapter 3 of James, verses 3 and following, with the illustration James gives us of how unruly the tongue can be. So until we meet again, we trust that we will open our Bibles and test the things which we hear. I want you to test the things that you hear on this video to make sure they are of God. Be like the Bereans. Test and make sure what you hear is from the Word of God. We look forward to coming back and continuing our look at James chapter 3. May the Lord be with you until we have that opportunity. God bless you.